Hello, my name is Jenna Lemire, and I am going to be reading chapter five of Nonviolent Communication, a Language of Life by Marshall B. Rosenberg, PhD. This is the second edition. It's very well loved. I'm reading this for a book club that I'm in, and um, you know, I am a feelings coach, <laughs> and <laughs> this particular book, I have to say, is like the most handing your ass to you book that there is because it forces you to really take a look at how to how we speak how we engage with other people um and then the impact of it and it gives the words to it this is something i can energetically feel and see the kind of underlying components of really easily but now like i'm having better flowery words to be able to describe some of it. Um, but what it does is it absolutely, um, it makes us immediately sort of take more responsibility for things and it will naturally kind of poke a little bit at our own like shame or guilt because we're going to recognize things that we can improve on in this book. So if you've made it this far and we're starting to go into things where it, it hits you personally or makes you um, kind of feel like, oh my God, I've totally been doing this or whatever. Um, well, we know when we know and then we can do better when we know better. So let's uh, let's go into it as positively as we can and shake up our Etch-A-Sketch and know that we are starting a new day and new life every single moment. And so we can move forward using this if it feels right for you. So in chapter five, it says, taking responsibility for our feelings. There's a quote here. People are disturbed not by things, but by the view that they take of them. Hearing a negative message, four options. Okay, the third component of NBC entails the acknowledgement of the root of our feelings. NBC heightens our awareness that we are what others say and do may be the stimulus, but never the cause of our feelings. That's a big one. We see that our feelings result from how we choose to receive what others say and do, as well as our particular needs and expectations in that moment. With the third component, we are led to accept responsibility for what we do to generate our own feelings. When someone gives us a negative message, whether verbally or non-verbally, we have four options as to how to receive it. One is to take it personally by hearing blame and criticism. For example, someone is angry and says, you're the most self-centered person I've ever met. So in choosing to take it personally, we might react Oh, I should have been more sensitive. We accept the uh, we accept the other person's judgment and then blame ourselves. And we, um, and then there's some side notes here. One of them says, "What others do may feel, or maybe this what others do may be the stimulus for our feelings, but not the cause." And then another little side thing: four options for receiving negative messages. One is blaming ourselves, which they're talking about here. And I'll turn the page. <laughs> So we choose this option, the one of blaming ourselves when we hear something negative, as a great cost to our self-esteem, for it inclines us toward feelings of guilt, shame, and depression. <clears throat> a second option is to fault speaker. For example, in response to, you're the most self-centered person I've ever met, we might protest. <clears throat> you have no right to say that. I'm always considering your needs. You're the one who is really self-centered. <laughs> When we receive messages this way and blame the speaker, we are likely to feel anger. When receiving a negative message, our third option would be to shine the light of consciousness on our own feelings and needs. Thus, we might reply, when I hear you saying that I am the most self-centered person you've ever met, I feel hurt because I need some recognition of my efforts to be considerate of your preferences. By focusing attention on our own feelings and needs, we become conscious that our current feeling of hurt derives from a need for our efforts to be recognized. Finally, our fourth option in receiving a negative message is to shine the light of consciousness on the other person's feelings 
and needs as they are currently expressed. We might, for example, ask, are you feeling hurt because you need more consideration of your preferences? We accept responsibility rather than blame other people for our feelings by acknowledging our own needs, desires, expectations, values, or thoughts. Note the difference between the following expressions of disappointment. So just to reiterate the things on the side here, that when we hear something negative, we have four options. One, blame ourselves, shame, guilt, that kind of stuff. Two, blaming others, anger, frustration, that kind of thing. Three, sensing our own feelings and needs. And then four, sensing others' feelings and needs. Um, and what I would recommend as almost like a homeworky type of thing is that as we're looking at like, okay, I'm feeling negatively, what's now going on in this experience? Do I feel a compulsion to want to blame? So just because that happens in us and now we've learned from a book that like not to do it, yet we're still probably going to have a version of us that initially will feel like, ah, yes, this is feeling this way and it's uh, your fault or, you know, or my fault, you know, or I should have whatever. So anyway, so I think we, that it's really good to just have the awareness so that as it comes up, we can be more like, oh my gosh, I'm noticing that I feel like I want to blame myself here. I'm noticing where I want to blame others here. And now I'm going to the next one is I, now I want to sense my own feelings and needs. So giving that a good moment and then, and only then, because after our own feelings and needs are discovered, that's the only time we can actually calm down a bit to be in logic or reason to be able to even look at somebody else's program in a compassionate way, um, where we can sense other people's feelings and needs. Okay, and so they're talking, they're going to go in a little bit more to that now with, um, we accept responsibility rather than blame other people for our feelings by acknowledging our own needs, desires, expectations, values, or thoughts. Note the difference between the following expressions of disappointment. So there's some examples here. Example one, you disappointed me by not coming over last night. Could be changed to, I was disappointed when you didn't come over because I wanted to talk over some things that were really bothering me. So speaker A attributes responsibility for the disappointment solely um, to the action of the other person. In B, the feeling of disappointment is traced to the speaker's own desire that was not being fulfilled. An example two, A, their canceling the contract really irritated me. So B, when they canceled the contract, I felt really irritated because I was thinking to myself that was an awfully irresponsible thing to do. Speaker A attributes, attributes her irritation solely to the behavior of the other party, whereas Speaker B accepts responsibility for her feelings by acknowledging the thought behind it. She recognizes that her blaming way of thinking has generated her irritation. In NVC, however, we would urge the speaker to go a step further by identifying what she was wanting, what need, desire, expectation, hope, or value of hers has not been fulfilled. As we shall see, the more that we're able to connect our feelings to our own needs, the easier it is for others to respond compassionately. To relate her feelings to what she is wanting, speaker B might have said, when they canceled the contract, I felt really irritated because I was hoping for an opportunity to rehire the workers that we had laid off last year. Oh my God, you see the difference? So when we're focusing on what we're hoping for, um, instead of just the fact that we're disappointed too, it's like, okay, to feel disappointed, but there's no room in that. Whereas if we're saying like, I'm disappointed and um, we can then lead into why in the way that we're still taking responsibility, it's not like it's your fault, then we're pointing on because this is what I imagine that could be happening in that I wanted to be able to rehire those, those laid off workers, then it's actually putting energy on what is wanted. And we're owning that we feel disappointed about it. And then that's how that can actually then happen. But if we're like, that was a dumb move. We don't, 
focus at all on why we thought it was a you know dumb move uh and then we just add all the blame and shame and everything on top of it it's like we're never going to get anywhere so I'm, I'm really liking this a lot okay the basic mechanism of motivating by guilt is to attribute the responsibility for one's own feelings to others when parents say it hurts mommy and daddy when you get poor grades at school oh my god ouch um they're implying that the child's actions are the the cause of the parent's happiness or unhappiness raise your hand if you felt this where your parents have said that they didn't take responsibility for their own feelings they were projecting on you that you're somehow the one that is like hurting their feelings over just being you or, or something you did or didn't do which is totally conditional and super fucked <laughs> but nonetheless they didn't know either and weren't taught for proper modeling because there wasn't stuff like this back then think about your parents 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 and where they would have got their resources for human development and psychology like if we go back even just three generations all they're having is like you know what Freud or like you know like come on there's there's so much more to this okay uh the the basic wait I already said that uh, on the okay about uh, when mommy and daddy when it hurts mommy and daddy when you get poor grades at school they're implying that the child's actions are the cause of the parents unhappiness or happiness on the surface feeling responsible for the feelings of others can easily be mistaken for positive caring oh this is big it appears that the child cares for the parent and feels bad because the parent is suffering however if children who assume this kind of responsibility change their behavior in accordance to parental wishes, they are not acting from the heart, but acting to avoid guilt. How many things are we doing to avoid guilt? So like putting this into, so basically if we're ever in a situation where mommy or daddy said, it hurts mommy or daddy when you blah, 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 then we're not going to want to blah, blah, blah. And we're going to do everything in our damnedest to show up as the version that mommy and daddy liked. And to the detriment, this is where shadow work comes in. So, so the part of you that gets bad grades or doesn't like doing homework or whatever will be put into the dungeon. And then our personality will be the one that does good, good grades and values grades but they value grades so much that they actually don't want to be guilting their parents. And so that lights up fuel. I really better get good grades and then we can get good grades and get good grades. And then all of a sudden we're, you know, 20 years into education, which isn't, there's nothing wrong with education, but let's look at, there's a lot of people that go into greater education running from the guilt of trying to make their parents happy. And then we'll have a big crash after a doctorate or a PhD, you know, or, or whatever, all the master, what all the different titles, um, then they end up in their own therapy because they kind of were thinking, okay, well, this is going to win the approval of my parents. And then it turns out that sometimes the level of consciousness the parents are in are not actually able to still give you the reward because if it was conditional before it's going to still be conditional they'll just be another condition and then it's like okay well yeah you did get all that kind of stuff but do you have a house yet do you have a partner yet do you have kids yet do you have a whatever so conditionality just doesn't ever end okay <clears throat> it is helpful to recognize a number of common speech patterns that tend to mask accountability for our own feelings number one use of impersonal pronouns such as it and that it really infuriates me when spelling mistakes appear in our public brochures that bugs me a lot so it and that is something to notice statements that mention only the actions of others when you don't don't call me on my birthday i feel hurt See, so adding the because in this time might be giving more information, but when we add in the becauses, we're going to want to do, um, you know, focusing it more on like what is actually wanted, because if 
it, you know, it's an opening where it can either either improve our energy or it's an opening where we can fuel even more in to negativity with a because. So we want to be careful on the becauses. Um, and I kind of took that on my own stuff without staying on the book right now. So hold on a sec. Um, okay, so the use of the expression, I, or wait, okay. Statements that mention only the actions of others. When you don't call me on my birthday, I feel hurt. Mommy is disappointed when you don't finish your food. The use of the expression, I feel an emotion because followed by a person or personal pronoun other than I, I feel hurt because you said that you don't love me. I feel angry because the supervisor broke her promise. <clears throat> so I wanna go back to that because thing on the birthday one. When you don't call me on my birthday, I feel hurt. So how we could open that up further is I feel hurt because I just love it so much when you call, you have in the past, and I think I might have set an expectation that that would happen again. And I'm not going to do that because setting an expectation I know doesn't always happen and can take away from somebody else's free will. But nonetheless, in this case, by saying, oh, I felt really hurt when you didn't reach out to me on my birthday um, because I like hearing from you. Then the energy goes over to where we can actually manifest liking and and what's wanted versus just a closed door on like you didn't call me on my birthday it sucked i think you should have you see what i mean because before the energy is on you should have called me and didn't <laughs> and there it is there it ends and then if you look at that vibrationally that means what will happen and then the next birthday and on the anniversary and on whatever, if we have that shouldn't and we don't it like has a closed door kind of thing where like only what is negative will continue to happen to us because that's what we're looking at. So it's still OK to absolutely feel hurt that you didn't get the call. I felt hurt when I didn't get the call. But saying like you didn't call me only keeping the energy there, not taking the responsibility and not also offering the other person a little more genuine idea of the because to where where you're fueling because I like it when you call me. It feels really good to be appreciated and remembered in that way. I felt really cherished the last time you called me by adding that additional information. It opens it up. And then as soon as somebody hears that. Oh my gosh, they really value getting my car. I didn't even remember it was their birthday at all. Like I just kind of spaced it. It's not like I meant to hurt you, whatever. In fact, this just happened recently. Um, I I forgot somebody's birthday that I had celebrated in the past a few times. I'm not big on celebrating other people's birthday, probably for this very big reason that there's a lot of expectations and stuff that go around it. But basically, um, and, you know, they have every right to like feel hurt by that. But I think if I, if they were to tell me like, oh yeah, I really felt hurt when I didn't hear from you on my birthday, because I really have enjoyed the gifts and the, th and, and hearing from you in the past, it always makes my day would feel a lot better and would be the thing that would make me want to reach out to them on their birthday again, the next time. Right. Um, but just otherwise, like, I'm just really hurt that you didn't reach out to me on my birthday. Boom. It closes the door. And then the person on the other end that hears that is just going to feel like guilt and shame probably. And there's no opening of what's actually wanted. So that's what I'm at least learning from this here. Okay. Connect your feeling with your need. I feel because. In each of these instances, we can deepen our awareness of our own responsibility by substituting the phrase, I feel because. All right, now this is where we get into how many times in sacred space meetings or in sessions where I have purposely told people that if they're focused on the because, they're not feeling their feelings. And yet we're in a book about feelings talking about the because. Okay, so there's a lot of paradoxes in our spiritual path and that kind of thing. Um, so when the because is opening the door and giving more information where you can take more responsibility for your feelings and you can take, you can discover more of what your need is and then you can ask more directly for your need with a because, 
then we can open up the because. But a lot of times what it does when we say the word because is I'm feeling angry because of this thing happening. Then we turn all of our attention on the thing to the detriment of actually feeling our feelings. So we just want to have a lot of um, clarity on how because can help, but also how because can be detrimental and actually pushing us away from our emotions in those moments. So examples here are, um, I feel really infuriated when spelling mistakes like that appear in our public brochures because I want our company to project a professional image. Oh my gosh. So see, in this case, if you had just heard, I feel really infuriated with spelling mistakes like that appear in our brochures. It's a closed door. They're just saying like, I feel infuriated and it's because this, and then it stays on the because this. It's not saying what their need is. It's not giving any room. It kind of keeps the blame here on the other person. And it keeps them feeling angry forever and kind of in a power state. But in this case, by saying they're because, they're able to identify what's wanted because I want our company to project a professional image. And so does the other person probably either too, right? And so what that is then is identifying why we want it is because we want to have a good image. And so then it's opening up and it's, it, it's showing what's wanted. And then we can both or all fuel into that what's actually wanted for it to then happen. Um, so in some cases, that can be good. Most people that are using because are almost always using it to defer to the thing in a negative way to actually avoid feeling their feelings. So that's where the, the indication can be helpful on, on the differences on the becauses. So there's another example here. Mommy feels disappointed when you don't finish your food because I want you to grow up strong and healthy. So that's mom uh, focusing more on or how the because can actually help and be like, I want a child to feel healthy and strong. Um, I still don't personally think that that's the best thing because it still feels like there's um, there's a lot that's put on the kid on this one. But nonetheless, uh, I guess this would be the best way still that a, a, a book's going to say to do it. Number three, I feel angry that the supervisor broke her promise because I was counting on getting that long weekend to visit my brother. Okay. So by learning that, um, feel angry that the supervisor wrote the problem because I was counting on getting a long weekend to visit my brother. So then it delivers the energy back on what is wanted, which is the person is actually needing more time with their brother. It's just, if they're like, uh, not focused on that in the good way and didn't, weren't able to identify the need. See, that's the thing is we wouldn't be able to identify what our needs are if we only push the blame there and don't kind of illuminate the because. So I feel angry that the supervisor broke her promise because I was counting on getting that long weekend. So it's like, I'm angry, I'm taking the responsibility and it's over here. It's like, I'm disappointed, not because of what you did. Normally it stays in because of what you did, period. When secretly it was also because I really want to go visit my brother. But if we're like angry over here and we're directing over there and it stays there, then we stay angry there. And our real then that we make is just how pissed off that we constantly are when the real need is, I want to bring him visit my brother, right? So see how this is really helping us discover the need. And when we shift from this over here to, I really want to see visit my brother, then it can happen because our focus is on what is wanted. We're lending our energy to actually seeing our brother, not on the energy of being pissed off at our boss. And you see how the law of mirroring will only, if, if one day I'm pissed at my boss, I don't share what I want with them or don't even know my needs of it, then the next day there's going to be something else my boss does that pisses me off. And the next day pisses me off. And if I don't know my needs and I'm not putting the energy over on where the needs can be met, see the difference? So pissed off, pissed off, pissed off gives us three days of pissed off at another reason we're pissed off at our boss. Whereas 
the other way, it shifts the energy to where like, oh, I've learned more about what my need is. I really want to spend time with my brother. And do you feel that if in a mirror, if I'm saying, I want to spend time with my brother, I really want to spend time with my brother. Boy, I'm really learning. I want to spend time with my brother. Then the universe is hearing, let's spend time with my brother and make something happen in the universe to be able to spend time with your brother. But if the other way, I'm really pissed at my boss, I'm really pissed at my boss, I'm really pissed at my boss. The next day, you have another reason to be pissed at your boss. Okay. So yeah, it's really helping deepen the need, our needs. The needs at the roots of the feeling, judgments of others are alienated expressions of our own unmet needs. Judgments, criticism, diagnosis, and interpretations of others are all alienated expressions of our needs. If someone says, you never understand me, they are really telling us that their need is to be under, understood is not being fulfilled. If a wife says, you're, you've been working late every night this week, you love your work more than you love me, she is saying that her need for intimacy is not being met. What we express our needs, when we express our needs indirectly through the use of evaluations, interpretations, and images, others are likely to hear criticism. And when people hear anything that sounds like criticism, they tend to invest their energy in self-defense or counterattack. If we're wishing for a compassionate response from others, it is self-defeating to express our needs by interpreting or diagnosing their behavior. Instead, the more directly that we can connect our feelings to our own needs, the easier it is for others to respond compassionately to our needs, like the brother thing. And a side note here says, if we express our needs, we have a better chance of getting them met. Yes. Unfortunately, most of us have never been taught to think in terms of needs. We're accustomed to thinking about what's wrong with other people when our needs aren't being fulfilled. Thus, if we want coats to be hung up in the closet, we may characterize our children as lazy for leaving them on the couch, or we may interpret our coworkers as being irresponsible when they don't go about their tasks as we would prefer them to. I was once invited to mediate in Southern California between some landowners and migrant farm workers whose conflicts had grown increasingly hostile and violent. I began the meeting by asking them two questions. What is it that you're each needing? And what would you like to request of the other in relation to these needs? The problem is that these people are racist, shouted a farm worker. The problem is, is, is that the people don't respect law and order shouted a landowner even more loudly. As is often the case, these groups were more skilled in analyzing the perceived wrongness of others than in clearly expressing their own needs. And whoever got the book before me had highlighted that part and I think it's worth highlighting. Usually we become more skilled in analyzing the perceived wrongness of others than in clearly expressing their, our own needs. In a comparable situation, I once met up with a group of Israelis and Palestinians who wanted to establish the mutual trust necessary to bring peace to their homelands. I opened the session with the same questions. What is it that you are needing that would, um, and what would you like to request from one another in relation to those needs? Instead of directly stating his needs, a Palestinian, uh, Mukhtar, I might have that word wrong. I'm not familiar. So apologies for anyone that is an M-U-K-H-T-A-R who is like a village mirror. I just learned on the next page answered. You people are acting like a bunch of Nazis. A statement like that is not likely going to get the cooperation of a group of Israelis. No, it's not. Almost immediately in an, in a, in a, ugh, almost immediately an, an Israeli woman jumped up and countered Mukhtar, that was a totally insensitive thing for you to say. Here we are people who had come together to build trust and harmony, but after only one interchange, matters were worse than they were when they began. This happens often when people are used to analyzing and blaming one another rather than clearly expressing what they need. In this case, the woman could have responded to the Mukhtar in terms of her own needs and requests by saying, for example, I am needing more respect in our dialogue. Instead of telling us how you think that we're acting, would you like, or would you tell us what it is that we're doing that you find disturbing? 
over and over, it has been my experience that from the moment people began talking about what they need rather than what's wrong with one another, the possibility of finding ways to meet everyone's needs is greatly increased. The following are some of the basic needs that we all share. Autonomy, to choose one's dreams, goals, values, to choose one's plan for fulfilling one's dreams, goals, and values. Another need is celebration, to celebrate the creation of life and dreams, fulfilled to celebrate losses, loved ones, dreams, mourning. Integrity, authenticity, creativity, meaning, and self-worth, interdependence, acceptance, appreciation, closeness, community, consideration, contribution to the enrichment of our life, to exercise one's power by giving that which can, contributes to life. Emotional safety, empathy, honesty, the empowering honesty that enables us to learn from our limitations, love, reassurance, respect, support, trust, understanding, warmth, play, fun, laughter, spiritual communion, beauty, harmony, inspiration, order, and peace, and then phys physical nurturance, air, food, movement, exercise, protection from life-threatening forms of life, viruses, bacteria, insects, predatory animals, rest, sexual expression, shelter, touch, and water. So what I love about this page is that I, I kind of went into it without like prefacing, but all of these here are a list of what actual needs are that you have a right to. So if you have the book and are like, hmm, I need to really see like, what do I have a right to have a need for? I mean, you know, like, and maybe just by seeing them be like, yes, I, there might be some way to like own that even more. I do have the need to choose my own dreams, goals, and values. I do have a need to choose to be able to plan for those dreams. I do have a need to celebrate things. You know what I mean? So I would recommend at this part of the book going through and like really solidifying that these are absolutely rightful needs to have. The pain of expressing our needs versus the pain of not expressing our needs. In a world where we're often judged harshly for identifying and revealing our needs, doing so can be very frightening. Women in particular are susceptible, are susceptible to criticism. For centuries, the image of the loving woman has been associated with sacrifice and the denial of her own needs to take care of others. Because women are socialized to view the caretaking of others as their highest duty, they have often learned to ignore their own needs. At one workshop, we discuss what happens to women who internalize such beliefs. These women, if they ask for what they want, will often do so in a way that both reflects and reinforces the beliefs that they have no general right to their needs and that their needs are unimportant. So that's why I think going back on the other one and like really owning, like I have a right to do this will really help in our shadow work practice. For example, because she is fearful of asking for what she needs, a woman may fail to simply say that she's had a busy day, is feeling tired and wants some time in the evening to herself. Instead, her words come out as sounding like a legal case. You know, I haven't had a moment to myself today. I ironed all the shirts. I did a whole week's laundry. I took the dog to the vet, made dinner, packed the lunches, called out to the neighbors about a block meeting, blah, 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 blah. Her plaintive request elicits resistance rather than compassion from her listeners. They have difficulty hearing and valuing the needs behind her pleas and furthermore react negatively to her weak attempt to argue from a position of what she should or deserves to get from them. In the end, the speaker is again persuaded that her needs don't matter, not realizing that they were expressed in a way unlikely to draw a positive response. If we don't value our needs, others can't either. Oh, that's so good. So please go back on the other end and really sit in the, I have a right to this need. I think that'll be very important. My mother was once at a workshop where another or other women were discussing how frightening it was to be expressing their needs. Suddenly she got up and left the room and didn't return for a long time. She finally reappeared looking very pale in the presence of the group. I asked mother, are you doing all right? Yes, she answered, but I just had a sudden realization that it's very hard for me to take in. What's that? I've just become aware that I was angry for 36 years with your father for not meeting my needs. And now I realize that I never once clearly told him what I needed. My mother's re revelation was accurate. Not one time can I remember her clearly expressing her needs to my father. 
she'd hint around and go through all kinds of convolutions, but never would she ask directly for what she needed. She didn't know that she could. That was my insert. We tried to understand why it was so hard for her to have done so. My mother grew up in an economically impoverished family. She recalled asking for things as a child and being a, a bonnet, a, <laughs> admonished <laughs> by her brothers and sisters. You shouldn't ask for that. You know we're poor. Don't you think that, or do you think that you are the only person in the family? Cut off her need for or her connection with her own needs. Anyone relate? eventually she grew to fear that asking for what she needed would only lead to disapproval and judgment. She related a childhood anecdote about one of her sisters who had an appendix operation and afterwards she had been given a beautiful little purse by, an, by another sister. My mother was 14 at the time. Oh, how she yearned to have an exquisitely beaded purse like her sister's, but she dared not to open her mouth. So guess what? She feigned a pain in her side and went the whole day with her story. Her family took her to several doctors. They were unable to produce a diagnosis. And so they opted for exploratory surgery. It had been a bold gamble on my mother's part, but it worked. She was given an identical little purse. Oh, when she received the coveted purse, my mother was elated despite being in physical agony from the surgery. Two nurses came in and one stuck a thermometer in her mouth. My mother said, mm-hmm, to show the purse to the second nurse who answered, oh, for me, why thank you, and then took the purse. Oh my God, this is hilarious. My mother was at a loss and never figured out how to say, I didn't mean to give it to you. Please return it to me. Her story poignantly reveals how painful it can be when people don't openly acknowledge their needs. Oh my God, that's the perfect story for that one, right? from emotional slavery to emotional liberation. In our development toward a state of emotional liberation, most of us seem to experience three stages in the way that we relate to others. Stage one, in this stage, uh, which I refer to as emotional slavery, we believe ourselves responsible for the feelings of others. We think we must constantly strive to keep everyone happy. If they don't appear happy, we feel responsible and compelled to do something about it. This can easily lead us to see the very people who are closest to us as burdens. Taking responsibility for the feelings of others can be very detrimental to intimate relationships. I routinely hear variations of the following theme. I'm really scared to be in a relationship. Every time I see my partner in pain or needing something, I feel overwhelmed. I feel like I'm in prison. I feel like I'm being smothered and I just have to get out of the relationship as fast as possible. This response is common among those who experience love as denial of one's own needs in order to attend to the needs of the beloved. In the early days of a relationship, partners typically relate joyfully and compassionately to each other out of a sense of freedom. The relationship is exhilarating, spontaneous, wonderful. Eventually, however, as a relationship becomes serious, partners may begin to assume responsibility for each other's feelings. And it's saying here, first stage, emotional slavery. We see ourselves responsible for others' feelings. If I were a partner who is conscious of doing this, I might acknowledge the situation by explaining, I can't bear it when I lose myself in relationships. When I see my partner's pain, I lose me, and then I just have to break free. However, if I've not reached this level of awareness, I'm likely to blame my partner for de the deterioration of the relationship. Thus, I might say, my partner is so needy and dependent, it's really stressing out our relationship. In such a case, my partner would do well to reject the notion and that there is anything wrong with her needs. It would only make a bad situation worse to accept that blame. Instead, she could offer an empathetic response to address the pain of my emotional slavery. So you find yourself in panic. It's very hard for you to hold on to a deep caring and love, onto the deep caring love that we've had without turning into a responsibility due to your obligation. You sense your freedom closing down because you think you can constantly have to take care of me. If, however, instead of an empathic response, she says, are you feeling tense because I have been making too many demands on you? Then both of us are likely to stay enmeshed in emotional slavery, making it that much more difficult for the relationship to survive. Stage two, in this stage, we become aware of the high cost of assuming responsibility for others' feelings and trying to accommodate them at our own expense. 
When we notice how much of our lives we've missed and how little we've responded to the call of our own soul, we may get angry. I refer jokingly to this stage as the obnoxious stage because we tend toward obnoxious comments like, that's your problem. <laughs> I'm not responsible for your feelings when presented with another person's pain. We are clear that we are not responsible for, but have yet to learn how to be responsible to others in a way that is not emotionally enslaving. As we emerge from the stage of emotional enslavement, we may continue to carry remnants of the fear and guilt around having our own needs. Thus, it is not surprising that we end up expressing those needs um, in ways that sound rigid and unyielding to the ears of others. For example, during a break in one of my workshops, a young woman expressed appreciation for the insights that she'd gained into her own state of emotional enslavement. When the workshop resumed, I suggested an activity to the group. The same young woman then declared assertively, I'd rather do something else. I have sensed that she was exercising her newfound right to express her needs, even if they ran counter to those of others. To encourage her to sort out what she wanted, I asked, do you want to do something else, even if it conflicts with my needs? She thought for a moment and then stammered, yes, or, or I mean, no. Her confusion reflects how in the obnoxious stage, we have yet to grasp the emotional liberation entails more, more than simply asserting our own needs. I recall an incident during my daughter Marla's passage toward emotional liber liberation. She had always been the perfect little girl who denied her own needs to comply with the wishes of others. When I became aware of how frequently she suppressed her own desires in order to please others, I talked to her about how I'd enjoy hearing her express more her uh, express her needs more often. When we first broached the subject, Marla cried, but daddy, I don't wanna disappoint anyone. She protested helplessly. I tried to show Marla how her honesty would be a gift more precious to others than accommodating them to prevent their upset. I also clarified ways that she could empathize with people when they were upset without taking responsibility for their feelings. A short time later, I saw evidence that my daughter was beginning to express her needs more openly. A call came from her school principal, apparently disturbed by a communication he'd had with Marla, who had arrived at school wearing overalls. Marla, he had said, young women do not dress this way, to which Marla had responded, fuck off. Hearing this was a cause for celebration. Marla had graduated from emotional slavery to the obnoxiousness. She was learning to express her needs and risk dealing with the displeasure of others, which is a perfect stage, by the way, that we all need to. We just need to recognize, just recognize it. Um, Marla had graduated from emotional slavery to obnoxiousness. She was learning to express her needs and risk dealing with the disple displeasure of others. Surely she had yet to assert her needs comfortably and in a way that respected the needs of others, but I trusted this was a, would occur in time. Stage three. Um, stage three, I'm gonna just tell my client really quickly. Hold on. Hey there, so I am reading Nonviolent Communication live right now. And I'm almost done and I just want to finish it before taking our call. So I will be there very shortly at just maybe five minutes later than when we'd planned. I will see you soon. Okay. <clears throat> so thank you for letting me do that in the middle of this call. But I, I want to complete this chapter. Okay. So At, I'll start with stage three. At the third stage, emotional liberation, we respond to the needs of others out of compassion, never out of fear, guilt, or shame. Our actions are therefore fulfilling to us as well as to those who receive our efforts. We accept full responsibility for our own intentions and actions, but not for the feelings of others. At this stage, we are aware that we can never meet our own needs at the expense of others. Emotional liberation involves stating clearly what we need in a way that communicates that we are equally concerned that the needs of others are fulfilled. NVC is designed to support us in relating at that at this level. Summary. The third component of NBC is the acknowledgement of the needs behind our feelings. What others say and do may be the stimulus, but never the cause of our feelings. When someone communicates negatively, we have four options as to how to receive the message. One, blame ourselves. Two, 
blame others. Three, sense our own feelings and needs. Or four, sense the feelings and needs hidden in the other person's negative message. Judgments, criticisms, diagnosis, and interpretations of others are all alienated expressions of our own needs and values, which basically is showing us the mirror in law of attraction. When others hear criticism, they tend to invest their energy in self-defense or counterattack. The more directly that we can connect our feelings to our needs, the easier it is for others to respond compassionately. In a world where we are often harshly judged for identifying and revealing our needs, doing so can be very frightening, especially for women who are socialized to ignore their own needs while caring for others. In the course of developing emotional responsibility, most of us experience the three stages, emotional slavery, believing ourselves responsible for the feelings of others, to the obnoxious stage in which we refuse to admit to caring what anyone else feels or needs, and three, emotional liberation in which we accept full responsibility for our own feelings, but not the feelings of others while being aware that we can never meet our own needs at the expense of others. NBC in action. Bring back the stigma of illegitimacy. A student of nonviolent communication volunteering at a food bank was shocked when an elderly coworker burst out from behind the newspaper. What we need to do in this country is to bring back the stigma of illegitimacy. The woman's habitual reaction to this kind of statement would have been to say nothing, to judge the other severely but silently and eventually process her own feelings safely away from the scene. This time, though, she remembered that she had the option of listening for the feelings and needs behind the words that had shocked her. Um, woman says, first checking out her guess as to what the coworker was observing. Are you reading something, uh, something about teenage pregnancies in the paper? Coworker, yes, it's unbelievable how many of them are doing it. Woman, now listening for the coworker's feeling and what the unmet need is might be giving a rise or the listening for the coworkers feeling and what the unmet need by giving rise to the feeling. I can't say this. She was listening for her coworkers feeling and what the unmet need was uh, that the, that was giving rise to and said, are you feeling alarmed because you'd like kids to have more st stable families? See, so she's sort of directing into what is wanted and kind of helping someone with their own needs in this co-worker of course do you know that my father would have killed me if I had done anything like that Ooh. so you're and then the woman says so you're remembering how it was for the girls in your generation who got pregnant sure thing we knew that what would happen to us if we got pregnant we were scared about it all the time not like the girls nowadays and then we she said are you annoyed that there is no fear of punishment for the girls who get pregnant these days well at least fear and punishment worked. It says here that these girls are sleeping around with different men just so that they can get pregnant. That's right. They have babies and the rest of the society has to pay for it. The women, the woman heard two different feelings in the statement, astonishment that the girls would deliberately get pregnant and annoyance that the taxpayers had to end up paying for the children born in this way. She chose which feeling to empathize with women. Are, are you, astonished to realize that people are getting pregnant these days without consideration for reputation, consequences, financial stability, and all the things that you used to consider. Coworker says, feeling heard around this you know, the astonishment, she now moved to her other feeling that of annoyance, as often happens when there's a mixture of feelings present. The speaker will return those to turn to those that have not received the empathic uh, attention. It is not necessarily for the listener to reflect back a complex mixture of feelings all at once. The flow of compassion will continue. Each feeling comes up in its own turn. Yeah, I guess um, that's just the side note. And then, um, yeah, and guess who ends up paying for it? Sounds like you're exasperated because you'd like your tax money to be used for other purposes. Is that so? Certainly is. Do you know that my son and his wife want a second child and they can't have one? even though they have two jobs because it costs so much. I, and then the woman says, I guess you're sad about that. You'd probably love to have a second grandchild. Yes, and it's not just for me that would make a difference. 
Uh, and the woman says, and for your son to have a family that he wants, even though the woman guessed only partially correct, she did not interrupt the flow of empathy, allowing the coworker to continue to realize other concerns. Yes, I think it's sad to be a single child too. Oh, I see. So you'd like for Katie to have a little brother. Well, that'd be nice. At this point, the woman sensed a release in her coworker, a moment of silence elapsed. The woman felt surprised to discover that while she wanted to express her own views, the urgency and tension had dissipated because she no longer felt adversarial. She understood the feelings and needs behind her coworker's statements and no longer felt that the two of them were worlds apart. Woman, you know, when you first said that we should bring back the stigma of illegitimacy, I got really scared because it really matters to me that all of us here share a deep caring for people needing help. Some of the people coming here for food are teenage parents, and I would want to make sure that they feel welcome. Would you mind telling me how you feel when you see Deshal or Amy and her boyfriend walking in? The woman expressed herself. See, so that was her expressing the because and what was wanted because she wants people that did have illegitimate babies to also feel comfortable and is including in there. The dialogue continued with several more exchanges until the woman got the reassurance that she needed that her coworker did indeed offer caring and respectful help to unmarried teen clients. Even more importantly, what the woman gained was a new experience in expressing disagreement in a way that met her needs for honesty and mutual respect. In the meantime, the coworker left satisfied that her concerns around teen pregnancy had been fully heard. Both parties felt understood about their relationship benefiting benefited from their having shared their understanding and differences without hostility. In the absence of NBC, their relationships may have begun to deteriorate from this moment and the, and the work that they both wanted to do in common, taking care and helping people might have suffered. And number three exercise in this one is acknowledging needs. To practice identifying needs, please circle the number in front of the statement whereby the speaker is acknowledging responsibility for his or her own feelings. You irritate me when you leave company documents on the conference floor. I feel angry when you say that because I'm wanting respect and I hear your words as an insult. I feel frustrated when you, be, when you come late. I'm sad that you won't be coming for dinner because I was hoping we could spend the evening together. I feel disappointed because you said that you would do it and you didn't. I'm discouraged because I would have liked to progress further in my work by now. Little things people say sometimes hurt me. I feel happy that you, re you received that award. I feel scared when you raise your voice. I am grateful that you offered me a ride because I was needing to get home before my children. And then it says the responses to all those. One, uh, well, we, we are, we'll probably go over those statements. We're going to go over all those statements in book club. So, um, and for those of you who want to take a screenshot of the book, and again, the notes are someone else's, um, cause this is a used book, but go ahead and practice those. Um, you could have screenshot, go back and do it. And then there's, um, all the answers that we'll talk about in book club and chapter six will be next. And, uh, I'm going to see my client now. Okay, bye.